What a book this is. Rare. Gem. Horrific. Insightful. Explaining. The Challenge of the Dead by Stephanie Graham. And I'm going to read the epilogue. The afternoon train speeds from Maubeuge to Paris. Am I right for Paris? you ask. And a Frenchman replies facetiously, Nash Paris, Nash Paris. In a few hours, you roll up the whole western front. You traverse infinite graveyards and scenes of desolation, like an arrow of thought, and a light where the German soldiers wish to be. The train has come from Berlin. It has passed through Cologne and the zone held by the occupying army. It roars forward to Saint-Quentin, Noyon, Compiègne, like the symbol of the march offensive. But in all the little shattered towns and villages, joy flags are flying and the bands are playing. It is, today, a fete of French victory and French peace. Besides being Armistice Day, it is the sans contenaire of the Republic, the day of the celebration of the first 50 years of the present Republic of France, and Paris will be alight end to end tonight with fairy lights. Paris and France will render homage to the Republic which brought victory. In 1870, under the fatal government of Napoleon III, a hated German conquered France. Then the Napoleons fell, and Gambetta made possible la revanche du droit. It could hardly have been predicted that within fifty years, the stricken, unstable France of 1870 would lay the Prussian low. The victory over the Germans has been an enormous confirmation of the success of the Third Republic, and has shed a glory on the line of presidents from Thiers to Millerand which is perhaps not entirely appreciated in other countries. The Republic celebrating its 50th birthday on November 11th sunned itself in as much glory as the army or the, or the nation. It is true that un soldat son nom représentant la foule héroïque des Boilus reposed on l'arc de triomphe. A nameless soldier representing the heroic crowd who fought is buried now in the arc de triomphe. But it is also true that the heart of Gambetta carried in a chariot accompanied the hearse of the unknown soldier, and whilst the soldier was buried in the first story of the triumphal arch, the heart of Gambetta was placed in the pantheon itself. All must redound to the greatness of France and of the Republic. As you step from the train at Paris, you realise that everyone is out for gaiety even before the gaiety has commenced. The Parisians are holding on to one another, humming and singing baby song, making believe to stumble as they walk. Gone are the care and solemnity of the weekday Paris crowd. A heaviness has been shed. Everyone feels light as if there was quicksilver in his heels. Evening is just turning to night, and all houses are giving forth their people, and they stream to the centre in ever-increasing crowds, all gay, all light-hearted, all without a thought of ever coming home. The city is cleverly decorated with mass flags, arcades of flags, but without those strings of buntings which so often look like coloured washing hanging out to dry. The illuminations are to be most elaborate. Hundreds of thousands of francs are being spent in coloured light effects. There will be a torchlight procession, massed bands and street dancing till morning, long lines of men and women holding on to one another plunge through the crowds and scream and break and join again. Everyone is wearing a little flag of the Republic. Men and women are to be seen carrying little red paper lanterns on bamboo sticks. Every restaurant and cafe is crammed and jammed with people with flushed faces. The waiters have lost control. Bring you dishes you have not ordered, but graciously accept them for the mieux. Hawkers keep bellowing the last edition of the paper, especially of Long Transigeant, which says that the meaning of the festivities is that the Allies are agreed 
to force Germany to fulfil the treaty to the letter. Night, meanwhile, has become night with no stars above and all the stars below. The crowds have become immense. If you are at the Place de la Concorde, where part of the torchlight procession is forming up, and men are playing on the crowd with ghastly searchlights, then you are likely to remain at the Place de la Concorde. It will take you two hours to struggle to the Place de l'Opera. On the underground railway, some stations are blocked, and no one can get either in or out, notably Hotel de Ville. Out at the Arc de Triomphe, there is a cavalry guard with drawn sabres. The Arc, very fittingly, has no illumination, but its dark mass catches the light beams from the buildings around. No one knows what is going to happen here, all the little folk stand on tiptoe and strain their eyes and yet see naught. Lots of girls are mounted on men's shoulders with legs round men's necks and their ankles grasped in male hands, and they certainly see nothing which is to be seen. All are laughing, all are ready to sing and to roll in gaiety. Presently, some statesmen in carriages pass out between lines of cavalrymen. Big Bertha, the great gun, follows them, and then an empty Roman chariot, and a hearse on which the poilu inconnu was carried. But even when these pass, the crowd remains riveted to the place where the unknown soldier reposes, constantly expecting some marvel of the night to start from there. Similar crowds hold the Place Vendôme, where Napoleon stands on his column of stone the Saint Simon of Paris. This statue also commemorates a national victory over Germany, though it elevates one soldier so high. The design of the frieze at the foot of the column is one of accoutrement and weapons and adornments and uniforms and guns, but without a limb or a face anywhere, the meaning being that one man wore all the glory. Here is exhibited not much joy in the Republic, but a whole series of advertisement for French state loans. On the whole, the sans conteneur of the Republic may be a good advertisement for government stock. All manner of provincials have come to Paris for this day, and there is no doubt they are dazzled by the grandeur of France. At the Palais Royal, there is one of the most radiant designs in coloured lights. The whole front of the place is covered with a picture of light which reminds one of the advertisements of the Great White Way between 40th and 50th Street, New York. Crimson and emerald and gold tell the glory, tell the glory of the 50 years of the Republic, the numbers 1870 and 1920 being festooned with dazzling light, and the names of all the presidents in one great row, Thiers, MacMahon, to Deschanel, and Milrand, given the prominence of a dynasty. On all the sidewalks down below arc trees of naked flames, gas pipes with branches coming out of the pavement, and instead of leaves, little jets of twinkling flame at which the crowd lights its cigarettes. The entrances to the Grand Avenue are surmounted by fantastic arches of most gorgeous illuminated colouring, in front of all this stand men and women, thoroughly épaté, hypnotised by it, with mouths open and eyes dilated. Oh, but it's wonderful. I cannot take my eyes off it, can you? Look, neighbour, just look at that, eh? Ah, but look. What splendour! What an effect! And there is audible all the while a continuous collective low murmur of approbation and satisfaction. You walk slowly along the Avenue de l'Opera. There are un uninterrupted rows of footlights along the bases of first and second stories, throwing a lurid glamour on solemn and stately tricolours. So it is all the way to the Opera House, and happy crowds fluttering and chattering, now breaking into an infection of expectancy, when all push forward to see something imagined, interest, somewhere and then lurching back in gay delusion and laughter. The lofty buildings, like monuments to the goddess of trade, look down on diminutive people with bright faces and round heads. The stone itself of Paris seems indulgent. 
Away, however, in those strange fields covered with darkness, at this midnight hour, unilluminated lie the silent ones, crosses without end, the signs of life laid down. France will not forget them, and we shall not forget. So let us leave this gaiety behind and take the midnight train for Calais, for Dover, for London, for the Cenotaph, the Abbey, for new life. It is a full train and pulls out soberly from the gay city and bears onward, onward to the little channel and the waiting boat which ere the dawn shall face the wonderful white cliffs of Albion and home. The most enduring moment of Armistice Day will be the silence at eleven, the moment of communion. In America, in many cities, work ceased at eleven, but everyone was instructed to make the utmost noise possible. Thus, a year ago at New Orleans, the writer of these lines listened to an infernal din of train whistles, factory sirens, steam horns and hooters, clashing church bells, roaring klaxon horns, hammering of anvils, squeaking of trumpets, and shouts of people, and the thought inevitably came, the West does not understand. It did not suffer as we did, and came into a share in it all too late. Only the end of a small war can express itself in noise, the end of such an one, as this in Europe was silence. And a fitting monument of silence is the cenotaph, the empty tomb, England is very happy in the cenotaph, much more happy than in the Edith Cavell statue, which leaves out the last words of the kind nurse, does not say patriotism is not enough, but writes Brussels Dawn instead, making her a kindler of anger against a foe rather than a sal salver of wounds. The impersonal cenotaph, without any cross or weeping Christ, or rampant lions, without even the pronoun our, which some wish to see upon it, our glorious dead, instead of the glorious dead, can stand for all who laid down their lives, baptised or unbaptised, white or coloured, friend or foe. For even Germans had to die that Europe might be free. So in leaving the fields of the dead and the beginning, and the end of the war, and Paris itself, you come naturally to the cenotaph, the stone which gathers to itself all the experience, and all that was shared and sacred in the war. The altar at the summit of a thousand weary steps. It stands in the midst of England's great street of government, twixt Nelson and the Abbey, and says to all who pass, Go and do thou likewise. To all the selfish, we were not selfish. To the clamorous, we are silent, yet we speak. To the strident and ambitious, to the self-seekers and the cynical, to those who live as though there has been no sacrifice, to those who sneer at the ideal, we suffered and died that you might have your life, that all might have more life. We suffered and died for the good of the whole. When Millerand was elected president of France, his supporters insisted that always that they had found a man whose public life would be worthy of France and of her dead. France's idea was that through the sacrifice of her sons, France should become greater yet. Our men did not die that England might become greater but that Europe might be saved from tyranny and greed. And it is for us and our public men to see that their sacrifice shall never seem to grow barren. It will grow barren unless we who now live are ready to continue the sacrifice. No good comes into the world but after struggle and pain. No new life comes but through death. No common weal is gained without giving and serving. Our common life must have a foundation of human hearts, ready to give, ready to live, for England and for us all. 
It hath been said, He liveth best who is always ready to die. It can be put in a new way. He liveth best who is always ready to put all upon the altar. Humanity is well served when nations are ready to sacrifice themselves for her good. She is worse served by the nations who still preserve the tribal instinct to fight and destroy their neighbours. She is worse served by the nations who are enslaving other nations. And that nation is most alive which has most people ready to sacrifice themselves and their estate. That nation liveth worse which contains the most selfish. Of Christ it was written, he saved others, himself he could not save. But the selfish man saves himself first, and then thinks of others. The selfish man is quarrelsome, and runs easily to law. He enacts guarantees, he counts his costs, he heavily insures. He holds what he does not want, and is afraid of another getting it. That nation liveth best whose men and women are freest for an adventure, but worst whose men and women are most cautious. He is most happy who has run to the altar and surrendered his all there to God, and then found a will and a way in which to live. For most, alas, there is no altar visible, no way to an altar. They do not know what the altar is, nor what it is for. Business and war and hate and selfish desire have hidden it from men's eyes. Only when the cloud lifts the altar is disclosed, and men commonly when they see it leave all that they have and run to it and fling themselves before it in tears. It is the grand altar of humanity, the altar of all on which the one sacrifices himself. It is the altar of the sacrifice of Christ, the cross. The quartering of humanity, an altar in the midst of the people. All education and literature and religious mission should be to one end, that the way to the altar may be kept clear. It is work to clear away all the obstructions and the fogs and the mists. Sweet singing, pious exhortation, the reading of books, love of the dim religious light of churches. These should not be ends in themselves. Humanity has its pious part which goes to church, but it does not need the organisation of the pious. Humanity has its charitable part, but it does not need the organisation of the charitable. Humanity has its cultures, but it does not stand in need of schools or forts and cults and intelligentsia. But humanity does need sacrifice upon one great altar every day and all days. The cenotaph rising in our midst may be our altar. We may leave our flowers there, the incense smoke of burning hearts. But the flowers should be our lives. The cenotaph, after all, is only the visible sign of the great invisible cenotaph of humanity, which stands in the midst of the ages, an empty tomb in memory of all those who have gone before, of those whose sacrifice without ours is not perfect. At Westminster Abbey, they have buried the dead soldier among poets and statesmen. They have dug up from France, Tom, Dick or Harry, one of us, unnamed, unknown, who laughed and talked and marched and fired and suffered in the war. One of the many who are always unknown. He did guard duty, no doubt, in France. He is put on sentry again. Touching as it is to have a soldier in the dim light of the abbey, where so many can shed invisible tears. It had been better, perhaps, in a stern era, to have posted him at St. Stephen's, at the entry to Parliament, that he might challenge in his silence all who enter there to stand for England. Who goes there? Friend. Advance and be recognised. Pass. Friend. Proceed at your peril, if you cannot meet the challenge of the dead. Amazing.